uh, a big quarter of voters simply vote for candidates who are in office when times are good and against candidates which are in office when times are bad. It's, it's, it's simply a matter of, you know, are they making more money than they did uh, the last voting cycle? And if yes, they'll vote yes. If no, they'll vote no. It has nothing to do with, there's no, there's no systematic analysis of what's going on at all. And then there are people who vote just randomly. Uh, there seems to be no, no determiner, and that's 22%. Uh, moreover, in many cases, neither self-interest nor the character of the times is accurately assessed. So the people who vote on the basis of what they perceive as whether times are good or times are bad often misperceive whether the times are good or times are bad. Uh, so again, the, the rationality of this voting uh, procedure is called into question. As uh, uh, one commentator remarked, uh, in 2004, uh, empirical studies imply that democratic practice no more expresses the true interests of the majority than does the divine right of kings. Uh, there's, there's little evidence that, that dem democracy actually produces votes that are for the common good. Now, in response to this challenge from Converse, uh, three theories have been developed. Uh, one is the political elites theory, that in fact if we, we allow elites to lead and then people can either veto or, or uh, support elites, then we can increase uh, rationality in democracy. Uh, um, this is a view that has been adopted by the Bush administration, uh, claiming of course that it is a political elite and knows more and, uh, you know, as Bush likes to say, you know, I'm the decider in chief. Uh, and it's been uh, uh, William Crystal, Alan Bloom, William F. Buckley, uh, the whole neocon community uh, basically adopts this view. Um, as you can rightly uh, appreciate, there are real problems with that, uh, as has been shown in practice. Uh, the second theory is heuristics. That people, that pe what looks like uh, an irrational behavior is actually operating on the basis of heuristics, and the heuristics really do make some sense. Like, take, take a simple example. Um, people who are taller get more votes than people who are shorter. Uh, uh, people do vote for tall people over short people. Uh, that's clearly a kind of heuristics that, that some people use. Well, it turns out that, in fact, tall people do tend to have a psychology, because they've been tall, they've been respected, uh, that, that a, a leadership psychology that makes them able to be leaders. So that maybe voting on the, on the basis of this heuristics of tallness is, is, has some rationality to it, after all. Uh, so there's the, the people like uh, uh, George Polia and others who have developed at some length the notion that, that People use heuristics which may look on the surface irrational, but in fact do have a rational, a rational substrate. Uh, the third response to Converse is collective opinion theory. This is the one that I find the most interesting because it's, it's closely aligned with some uh, beliefs or at least uh, intuitions that we seem to operate on with regard to web behavior. Uh, uh, one illustration, for instance, is the search engine Google, which increases intelligence on the basis of collective search responses by users who are mostly non-experts. So that you type in, you do a, a web search on Google, uh, and then Google records what you, uh, it gives you a list of responses, and then Google records what's your favorite response, what really is the answer to your question, and then that affects how the next person, how Google responds to the next person who types in the same search uh, criteria, right? Uh, and the intelligence of Google increases in the process, uh, even though it's mostly non-experts who are responding uh, to, who are, who are making, the, who, are, who are deciding what is a good response to their question. Um, so if you type in medieval philosophy, for instance, it's not with scholars of medieval philosophy who are typing in that question, they don't need Google, right? It's, it's, uh, it's high school students uh, that have got to write a, a, a term paper. But then they pick some site for medieval philosophy 
and uh, use it more than another site, Google records that, and so all this non-expert opinion becomes in, in, encapsulated in Google's response system, and it really does increase the, the rationality of the Google response system, so that now, when the medieval philosophy scholar uses Google, it gives him what he wants. Uh, morally addictive. Right? Um, democracy is defended as the primary source of knowledge about the good, sort of by, by virtue of this invisible guiding hand that that uh, it manifests itself in what uh, uh, James Sorokin calls the wisdom of crowds. Um, now I turn to the third uh, way in which philosophy has tried to uh, uh, make a contribution to uh, science, technology, and democracy, and this is in the relation between science and democracy. On the one, uh, first, uh, philosophy has tried to uh, 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 help science be more rational. Secondly, philosophy has tried to help democracy be more rational, discover its inner rationality, if you want. And third, now, technology, uh, philosophy has tried to, to make suggestions, argue for certain kinds of relations between science and democracy. Um, here's where I'm going to read a little bit more of, uh, of some of this paper, because here I do have what uh, I take to be a, uh, an argument that decisions about what kind of research and development is done in science and technology should be under, should be influenced, strongly influenced, by non-scientists and engineers. And they don't like this idea. Uh, what's, what scientists and engineers want is for, uh, in the case of public science, science funded by the government, they want the government to shovel money over their way, right? <laughs> Give you another bag of money. And then let the scientists over here decide how to spend, how to allocate. After all, the scientists and the engineers, we're the one, we're the best ones who know how to spend this money. We know what the cutting edge research is. If you if you let the, the hoi polloi make decisions about this, they'll they'll have us investigating all sorts of, of uh, you know flying saucer phenomena or something. And it's just a waste of, of taxpayers' money. And so they try to convince the public that it's in your interest, the public, to give us the money and let us make the decisions. Um, I want to argue that that's, that's wrong, that in fact the public should be involved in making decisions about how the scientists spend their own money. Um, there are three kinds of arguments. The, ar the argument here is closely associated with this interdisciplinary field of science, technology, and society studies. Um, I, I really, even though my degree is in philosophy, I've been more involved as as uh, Wolfgang also mentioned, sort of on the margins of, uh, of, of philosophy, uh, and uh, have found my home more in this interdisciplinary field of STS, science, technology, and society studies. And the, the argument that I'm going to uh, develop here a little bit is one that was first uh, really promote, presented in some kind of articulate form by Langdon Winter. Uh, Winner's argument for the political character of technological artifacts has undergirded much subsequent discussion of this issue. Uh, moreover, insofar as science becomes technoscience, the idea of some external democratic participation concerning the technoscientific decision making tends to trump arguments for scientific or technoscientific autonomy. Uh, two other people who have contributed to this argument are uh, uh, Andrew Feenberg, Richard Slow and uh, then a new, new younger scholar named Mark Brown. So I'm drawing on the, the work of these other people, but trying to synthesize it in a slightly different way. Um, and uh, what, I, what I want to argue is that one can distinguish three different kinds of arguments for the justification for democratic participation in techno-scientific decision-making. These three kinds of arguments are deontological, consequential, and virtue-ethical arguments. 